Welcome everyone to Talk and Rock Radio. My guest today is a multi-award winning martial artist. He's a retired karate fighter, a fight choreographer, a stuntman, actor, author, teacher, and motivational speaker. Welcome my friend, Mike Stone. Thank you very much, Rick. Great to be here. It's good to have you with us today. You know, I've thought about doing this for a long time. And of course, I lost track with you for uh, many years. And then uh, we finally touched base again about a year or so ago. And then here we are now doing a podcast. So it's so great to have you with us. What I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about kind of your whole life, your whole history. But I think first I'd like to kick it off with talking about your early years, you know, when you first started out um, in high school or whenever it was, when you got interested, when you were in athletics and got interested in karate, uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you want to just kind of start in, in, uh, in that time frame. Sure. Yeah. It, uh, it started for me, um, oh, maybe eight or nine years old. I was very interested and fascinated with the uh, Japanese culture, the people, the food, uh, customs, traditions, and of course the martial arts. So I watched a lot of uh, samurai movies and things like that uh, when I was quite young. Uh, but my junior year in uh, high school was when I uh, had an opportunity to start taking Aikido from um, uh, Koichi Tohei, who was the number one student of the founder of Aikido, uh, uh, Ueshiba, uh, Professor Ueshiba. So uh, he was, uh, Tohei was on a tour through the world and was doing uh, classes uh, in Hawaii. He had done them every year for several years before. And I had an opportunity to start Aikido then. So that, um, that was my first martial arts that I took up. And then from there, um, I played a lot of high school sports. I was the captain of the football and basketball team and ran the 400 meter uh, dash. And um, uh, I love to play all kinds of sports, especially sports that involve a ball, whether it's uh, golf, table tennis, tennis, whatever. So when I went into the army right after high school, uh, which was in 1962, and uh, I graduated in June, in July, the 4th of July, uh, not long, a couple of weeks after graduating from high school, I was inducted in the United States Army that I volunteered for three years. And after doing basic training in Fort Ord, California, and then going to finance school, Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, I was stationed for the remaining period of time at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. And that's where I met my my first karate instructor, uh, Sergeant Herbert Peters, he's also from Hawaii, uh, the same island I'm from, the island of Maui, and how the universe has um, is very synchronistic in its design is that um, I went to a unique boarding school for four years in high school, Lahaina Luna uh, in Lahaina. And uh, while there, I was a freshman as a boarder, one of the senior boarders who was a senior athlete and was a end, played the position of end in high school. Uh, I really admired him and liked the way he played and he was um, a, a hero of mine. And it comes to, comes to be when I met my karate instructor, it was his younger brother, Angus Peters, who was in high school with me as a senior when I was a freshman. So it's funny how the universe just cycles and makes people go round and round until you finally meet each other. But so uh, that's how I started my uh, karate training. And uh, from from there, our our ver very first class, which were uh, only about six people that uh, took the class, and of the six, four of us were from Hawaii. And uh, um, my very first day, I had already created a, a mindset from my early life, playing a lot of sports, competing all the time, and created a mindset that was really intensified and enhanced greatly by 
an assistant football coach named Jimmy Gregg, who spent two months of my junior summer preparing me for the season, football season in high school, my senior year. And uh, because of his tremendous dedication to me, I, in fact, I was confused why a guy that had an incredible life would want to spend his almost his entire summer spending his time with me five days a week, preparing and teaching me all the nuances of being an overall good football player. So I was not good my freshman, sophomore or junior year, but my senior year with the two months that I, I practiced with Jimmy Gregg, I created a very different mindset. And it was really because of the way he was. He was very competitive. And uh, that two months with him really changed my life. In, in fact, so much so that a day doesn't pass in my life where I don't think about him or apply many of the principles and philosophies I learned through him in the two months that allowed me, when I started karate, uh, again, a year after that in, in, um, uh, in the Army, that I already had such a powerful, positive way of thinking about myself and my abilities that even my very first day in training in karate, I already knew I had a belief system that said, I can be the best I can now in this present moment, even if I never threw a punch before. And that mentality, even though my instructor told us our first day that it would take me five years to get my black belt. And that's how long it would take because that was a norm. That was the standard of all people who came, who had trained in the Orient, whether they was Korea, Japan, Okinawa, China, that they told foreigners that trained in the Orient that if you go back to teach, there is a five-year period that you should not promote Anglos or foreigners to that level of black belt because that's how long it would take. And Yet I believed my very first day when he was telling me that it'll take me five years. I said, no, it's not going to take me that long. I can do it now. So I, I had the mindset that everything that he was teaching me, I believed in that moment that I was that idea already. I was acting as if it was true, that I'm not going to become one. I'm not going to learn. It's not going to take me five years. I'm not going to train hard, suffer and sacrifice like everybody else was doing. That I could be instantaneously the best that I could because the reality is, well, example right now, you and I, we're, 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 we're living in different time zones and we're in different places in the world, but the way the universe works is that you and I exist now in this present moment, regardless of the time zone and the difference in location. So universally speaking, we can only die physically where we both are right now. So our life can only end where we actually exist now regardless of the time zone and location so if that is the truth and i believe it is because it simply is that that's the only place i can actually live is where i exist now so if i'm if i'm wanting to learn to be another aspect of myself if i want to be the best i can be in truth i can only be the best where i exist that is in the moment I am training. So regardless of the length of time someone says it'll take me to be my best, I can choose to believe that the only time I can actually physically 
be my best is in the moment I am experiencing, which is now. So every moment now in my training was an opportunity for me to express that belief that I am my best. I'm not going to become my best later, four years, five years from now, that the only opportunity I truly have to be my best is the moment I'm actually in. So if you have this kind of belief like I had, then everything for you changes. Your perception of reality and how other people choose to live their life became very difficult for me to understand because I was already being and receiving the benefits, the accolades, the trophies, the response immediately when I went out and simply whatever moment, whatever tournament, whatever place it was, it made no difference to me in that moment. I simply believed I can do my best. So in the moment that I was fighting, regardless of who, it didn't matter who I was fighting, where I was fighting. It didn't matter to me how big they were, how fast they were, how strong they were, how experienced they were. None of these normal belief systems that other people have that negatively affect their outcome because they perceive this idea that somebody is better, stronger, faster, more experienced, uh, their techniques are better. I never believed that. I believed in the moment that I was actually performing, I never considered, in fact, I never believed I had an opponent. If I ever stopped to believe I had one, the opponent was me. That was my worst opponent. So if I went in there, regardless of who I was facing, and I fought some people that were six feet five, 250 pounds, and I was 5'11", and maybe 175, 180, it, it didn't matter to me. And yet these are issues. I mean, these are things that matter to a normal person. Their belief is, oh, he's bigger than I am. He's, he got much more experience. He's tougher, stronger. Look at his body. Look at his muscles. So these things affect our belief system. And obviously if they do, it'll affect our performance. But if you never consider that, or if you never allow them the way they feel and perceive you, that's not my problem. How you think about me is not my problem, it's your problem. So if I'm busy doing what I'm doing in the moment I'm experiencing that idea and I'm doing my best in that moment, and I'm not concerned about what you think, believe, or feel, or whatever experience you have or don't have. None of those issues are my issues. They become your issues. So I'm free to express myself in the moment I'm living to simply be my best without any of the restrictions or a lot of the negative realities that we impose upon us, which really is the limitations we experience, no matter what we're choosing to be or do. So that's what happened for me very fast, very young. I was only 19 years old at the time. And within six months, I became a black belt. I had won every tournament I entered. I won everything in sparring and kata at the same time, which was quite unique then because most people would specialize in one form of the martial arts or the other, although they were training in both and even in self-defense and other expressions of the martial arts. But I never believed, no matter what the discipline was, I never believed that I couldn't do an aspect of the discipline. Whatever I chose to do in that discipline, I could do. So I didn't have personal preferences about, oh, I only like fighting, or I only like kata, I only want to do self-defense, I only want to train in weapons, I only want to do this. No, it was all-encompassing because it doesn't matter your preference, it matters your expression. It, it matters your belief about yourself. When you start to limit and separate your abilities and skills because you have preferences, then you are already diminishing your skills and talents because you're deciding what you prefer. But if you welcome all things that you're learning, and I don't mean this about karate or martial arts, I'm talking about life itself. If you want to live the best life you can, then why should you separate yourself from all aspects of life? And people do this 
without being aware they're doing that. They continually separate themselves from themselves. And in the process, if you keep doing that, at some point, you're not even going to know who you are because you've diminished so many aspects of what you're capable and your potential to do and to be. So I found it very confusing. And the part that triggered a lot of my further discovery into this philosophy was I noticed immediately through, because of my success, how everybody around me, even though they were very skilled, very proficient, you know, people like Chuck Norris and a lot of the great people at the time I was competing with, not against. But I, I was always confused as to why, why are they having so much problem winning all the time, every time? Whereas I was so used to being consistent. I won all the time, every time. Why? Because I want to. I mean, why should I not choose that idea? Why should I choose to lose or win occasionally? That's not someone that is practicing the same mindset all the time. So if my mindset doesn't change, why should my result change? If I'm doing something a certain way, if I believe in myself a certain way, if I perform and express myself a certain way, and I'm getting consistent, successful results, why would I ever want to believe otherwise? And yet when I looked around at the people around me as good as they were, and many of them were exceptionally good, that they were not as consistent as I was in getting the same results over and over again. So I, I, I've talked for about 15 minutes already. I don't know that I've answered any of your questions, but. No, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, I was going to ask you, Mike, in comparison to Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris, which you worked with, um, were they of that same mindset or were they more like that other guy that was always thinking about winning at the moment? Or were you, were they thinking like you or were they, can you answer that for me? Well, again, I, I don't like to compare. And I, and no. I would say that uh, no matter whose name you gave me, if, if it was somebody in the martial arts at the time that I was doing it, obviously they were not thinking like me. Why? Because they were not getting the same results. So right. I'm not going to compare. I'm not going to judge and say, well, they're not thinking properly. No, they're thinking, listen, uh, this idea about comparing and judgment is also something I'm not interested in because the moment I start to judge and compare, I become equal to that vibration. That means I become equal to that energy. And if I'm judging or being condescending, because that's what pretty much judgment is, it's a condes condescending idea, uh, then I become that vibration. And that vibration, that vibration is not open to freedom of expression, uh, to being the best you can be. Uh, judgment has limitations. Freedom does not. So uh, I cannot say whether they were or not, but if people look for themselves, not, not for you and I to compare, but if Chuck, for example, looked at the difference between he and I, the way I was thinking and he was thinking, uh, and the reason I'm saying Chuck, because he is one of the people that asked me, how come you win so often, so effortlessly? And I said, I don't know. And I was not lying. I did not know what I was doing at the time I was doing it that allowed me to be consistently successful. I didn't know the mental process that I was doing that was any different from anybody else. I was simply believing like I heard people say, and especially Jimmy Gregg in my early years in, in uh, the two months he spent with me nearly every day training me to become a good football player. To give you an idea of that was in the two months when I started, when we started spring practice after our summer, because our first sport is football, American football. When, when the team came back to start spring training, I was ready to play uh, 60 minutes of football both ways, offense and defense. Uh, he had spent so much time with me on every aspect of the game, running, passing, blocking, kicking, punting. So I became the punter. I became 
uh, the wide receiver. I became a halfback. I became the quarterback at times. So I played every position. And yet for my three years prior to that, I did nothing noticeable at all on the football field. And yet we only played six games because there were three other high schools. Uh, we were four high schools on Maui, three others. And we played them twice, which is six games. And we played two preseason games against better teams from Honolulu, the main island. And yet in only those six or eight games, I became so proficient that not only was I selected as an all-star for that year as an end, but I had 5.6 rushing yardage as a halfback. And that was never my position. I played it every once in a while. Uh, but there was also an award they started that. It was called the Decade All-Star. So the, the newspaper started a thing called the Decade All-Star. So they went back to 1951 to 1961, which was the year I played. And they selected me as the best end in the state of Hawaii for 10 years. And I only played six games. Wow. So how does, how does someone do that? And really, I, I, I always do, and I will never not credit uh, Jimmy Gregg's belief in me more than I actually believed in myself. So it was his mindset that he transferred to me about believing in myself, that once I did that, it, it was just like, you know, the idea we have about habits, right? Habits are, uh, we can have mental habits and physical habits, and habits are simply recreating and repeating repetitiously over and over the same idea. So whether it's a thought or whether it's a physical movement, that idea becomes so ingrained, it's like a cable of consistency wo woven like metal, like steel. It becomes so much a part of you that the habitual thing that you've learned, whether it's mental or physical, becomes so ingrained that they say it's muscle memory, that you don't have to think anymore. You already done it so many times. And to a certain degree, that's true. But what happens to most of us is we create limiting and negative habits. And those are the things that we unconsciously relive over and over again and wonder why our life never works the way we expect it to. That why, why am I still making the same mistakes I made 20 years ago? Why, why doesn't my relationships ever work out? What, what am I doing wrong? Well, you're not doing anything wrong. You've just allowed yourself to be robotic and you simply allow yourself to get caught up in ways of doing things that you're not consciously aware in the moment you exist that you're doing that. So you slap yourself in the head and go, gee, why did I choose that? That was stupid. And then I say, wait a minute, next week you're going to do it again. <laughs> and you probably and you probably do. We're creatures so, of habit, right? <laughs> yes, we are. And again, if I may, we have been introduced to that belief by others. And by saying that, and by we repeating it and believing it, we become creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. That is not true. We can live in the moment and create our reality instantaneously instead of getting caught up in habitual thoughts of negativity that simply allow us robotically to repeat them. And then we question why our life failed, right. why everything never works out. Anyway, it's that kind of an idea. Let's talk a little bit about the first time you met uh, Elvis and Priscilla. Do you want to briefly discuss that? Yeah, I, I saw them before I actually physically met either of them because we, we didn't, well, we met one time at the same time, but it was such a brief thing where I was bodyguarding Phil Spector and we had gone to Elvis's show at the International Hotel, Hilton Hotel in Las Vegas. And uh, uh, the people responsible for Elvis, Colonel Parker and, and his record company, RCA, they invited Phil Spector to attend Elvis's concert and shows with the idea that 
they wanted Phil to possibly produce a single for Elvis. So El, uh, uh, Phil Spector took me and his wife, Veronica, she was the lead singer from the Ronettes, Be My Baby, very famous song. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had gone there. And after the show, we had been asked to go backstage and meet Elvis. And Priscilla was back there. But it was a very brief, brief introduction, just a few seconds. So that's the first time that we had actually met. But I had seen Elvis and Priscilla uh, a couple of years prior to that when they attended uh, a karate match between the mainland, that's the U.S. team, and the Hawaii team. And we fought at an Ed Parker event in Hawaii and Elvis and Priscilla were in Hawaii on vacation and they attended the event. But they came after the event started and they left before the event ended. And then Elvis uh, was instrumental in asking you to uh, to work with Priscilla. Is that correct? As far as teaching her martial arts? Yeah, he never asked me directly because at the time, uh, Elvis was uh, taking instructions, private lessons from Ed Parker when he was in Los Angeles. And so was Priscilla. But Priscilla apparently didn't want to, she wanted to try uh, another style, not Kempo, and she wanted to try another instructor. So I was not the first one that was suggested. I, I think because of location and proximity also for being talented was Chuck Norris. He had a school in Sherman Oaks and that was relatively close to Beverly Hills, whereas I lived all the way down 70 miles away in Orange County in Huntington Beach. So the, the initial idea for her to take lessons from someone else was not me, was actually uh, Chuck Norris, where I actually met her again on a couple of occasions at Chuck Sherman Oak School. And from that, we met. And then she had asked to get my number and would possibly think about coming to take lessons from me in Orange County, which I thought was absolutely ludicrous. I mean, you know, to drive 50, 60 miles one way, maybe a round trip of 120, 30 miles at night, you know, because that particular class that she eventually did come to was a seven o'clock class and it ended at nine. So, and then to drive back after nine o'clock all the way up to Beverly Hills by herself, because at that point she had never driven on the freeway by herself alone. So that was a, an unusual request. Now I know as as time marched on a little bit, uh, she did come and uh, asked to sit in on one of your classes. Uh, of course, you always gave permission to everybody to uh, to come and sit in a special area and, and watch uh, your classes when they yeah. were being conducted. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about how that process came about, and and then when you all started dating after that? Well, it, it started that she, um, I, I had met her at Chuck school before. And then at that time she persisted and insisted when I said no, because I said, you know, why should I give you my number? I mean, for you to call me and even think of driving that far. It was just a lot of things that didn't make sense to me at the time. Why, why someone like that would, choose to even think about driving that far to take lessons when Chuck Norris is a very capable instructor. So is Ed Parker. So there's a, there's a thousand other people in the Los Angeles area that she would have taken lessons from other than me. So the mere fact that she was asking, it seemed, it seemed ludicrous to me that she would even entertain that idea. So I never took her serious, although because she was persistent, I knew that she was serious. So I gave my number just to settle it and not, you know, be continually confronted with asking. And then one day while I was at, at, the, at school teaching my class during that afternoon class, she, she called and asked if she could come. This was, I think, on a Wednesday, and she called if she could come to watch the Friday class. And that since she's never driven on the freeway, she would have a girlfriend of hers named Nora, who is a wife of one of Elvis's people. Uh, and Elvis uh, was not in town at the time, probably back in Memphis or in Vegas somewhere. So she asked Nora to drive her to my to my school. 
And so she came to watch that class. And then after that, we on a Friday night, again, we normally have a pizza night for the instructors, uh, which was very close, you know, walking distance to the pizza parlor right next door. So she stayed around and kept asking questions and everything. And we were already closing up. And I said, oh, you know, listen, maybe you'd like to join us for pizza. We're going to go next door. And she says, oh, you think it'll be okay? And I said, yeah, fine. That's, you know, it's not a problem. So, because we were closing up the school anyway and people were leaving. And just the instructors and I would normally Friday night have a pizza night. So we invited her and she stayed and talked for a while. And then, you know, as people started to leave, she said, oh, okay, I'll go back. Would it be okay if I come back another time? I said, sure. But, you know, again, I'm always thinking like, why would you want to drive this far? It's crazy. So, and then she called again and came a couple other times and then wanted to start. So I said, yeah, but uh, as soon as she started, I know she was very serious because uh, even when I had, when I was up at Chuck schools on a couple other occasions that she was training along with other people, she seemed, you know, very serious about training. She was a good student. She loves to dance or her, Timing, rhythm, and balance and everything is, is quite good already. So, uh, and, and she was quite proficient and very serious. And, you know, she wasn't the prima donna and wanted to be treated special or uh, in the self-defense techniques or some of the blocking and kicking, you know, it involves making contact with the legs and arms. And, uh, you know, she never squealed or said, oh, that hurts or anything like that. So uh, she was uh, uh, quite serious about learning. So that's great. Um, how how long after the working with her did you all get into your series? I know you were all were together for what about four years. Um, yeah. Did that did that progress pretty fast, or were you teaching her for you know several months, or how did that happen? Yeah, it, it took maybe four or five months, but you know she started to drive all the time. You know when Elvis wasn't there again was either in Mel uh, Memphis making a movie or in Las Vegas or doing whatever he was doing and not in LA mm -hmm. then you know she spent most of her time to come down so there were I'm talking about four or five days a week to take classes so like like anything it's going to progress I mean you know things are going to move either progressively or regress it's going to either move forward it's not going to be stagnant and if not that it'll back up and because of her consistency of always being there, being available, uh, making, you know, she had the time because I guess Elvis wasn't there. She had the time to participate in a lot of other activities. She would go to other tournaments, uh, meet friends of mine, go to events that I was going to or was involved in with either my students or promoting myself on the four seasons. So it became my lifestyle became her lifestyle. As far as your time, uh, while all this was going on, Mike, were you uh, working with Phil Spector the whole time, or was that a, a brief period of time that you worked with him? And what was your relationship yeah, I, I with was, him? Yeah, my relationship with him lasted quite a while, over a nine-year period. Okay. And I never worked for him as a bodyguard daily. He would only call me on special events, different sporting events, going to different countries. He would only call me when he left uh, California to go to other places uh, and things like that. So, uh, but I enjoyed working with him only because of the tremendous variety of incredible talented people in the music industry I've met through him. Uh, not only the performers, but also the executive of major companies that I had, I was privy to meet because of our relationship. So I, I valued that very much. I didn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily like him as a person. Many times when I seen him deal with other people, he had a pretty much a Napoleon complex. Uh, he was very demanding of the perfectionist that he was. So but it was a, a funny incident that happened in the very beginning. In fact, during the hiring process, I guess I was, I was being auditioned to hire, but Phil had saw me fight at the 64 and 65 internationals. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. at Ed Parker and was taking lessons from another martial arts friend of mine, Beverly Hills, uh, named Emil Farkas from Hungary. And he was taking classes there, so was his children. But after that fight, he contacted me through Emil to ask if I would come up to talk. And then so we started talking about being a bodyguard on special occasion. But it was a funny thing because uh, (laughs) during the hiring process, I did a little research on him and found out what a tough guy he was to work with. I mean, he was not the most pleasant person to be around. Uh, So during the negotiations of my possible working with him from time to time, I said, yeah, I I said, but but you know, Phil, I just I just have one condition and, and that's pretty much it. I said, I know. I know what a bodyguard does. I know what to do. I know how to behave. I know how, because I was pretty small for a bodyguard for people like this. They normally hire bodybuilders, weightlifters that weigh 250, that can mm-hmm. bench press 500. I had a hard time lifting my own weight. So uh, he, he wanted me for the mystique that this was a world karate champion. This was a guy very skilled. Okay, he's not very big. Uh, so I, I mean, I understood the reality of, of my limitations also, my size limitations and what may be required uh, to work with people outside of the ring. So I simply told him uh, prior to being hired, I said, you know, Phil, uh, I know I'm being hired to protect you and I'll do my very best, but I'll only do it if you don't create the problem, if you go out and get me into trouble or get yourself in a situation that I would be forced to protect and defend you when you're in the wrong, when you're the one agitating and creating the situation, I'm going to tell you, I may help the other person. So he kind of thought I was joking and laughed when I said that. But one of the very first jobs that we went, I went on with him was the world championship at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City. And the finals were between Luther Lasseter and Joe Balsas. And they were all of the very top players, uh, billiard players at the time at the Waldorf Astoria. And when we first arrived, uh, I got to see partly what his full-time bodyguard, George Brandt, who's an ex-retired police officer in Los Angeles. He said, Mike, the first day, in fact, when I drove up and I went to Phil's castle in La Colina above sunset, and I got out and George Grant was the one to meet me when I drove up. And he leaned over and says to me, just be careful, Phil may get you killed someday. And I kind of went like, what? And he says, I'm not joking. And then he let me walk in the house. So this is my first warning from his full-time bodyguard, George Brandt, that said, just be careful because Phil loves to instigate chaos and trauma or drama. So uh, at that night when we walked in, uh, Phil carries this um, uh, silver plated like uh, briefcase that you always see in in films during that time in the 70s. And Phil carries a lot of cash in the briefcase, which I did not know. But he pulled over, went to a counter and opened up the thing and grabbed a stack of money, which was about $10,000 and asked me to hold that. And I had to wear a suit. So I put it on the inside vest pocket of my suit. And um, he walked outside and started to become obnoxious and challenge people to who was going to win, who has the courage to bet, how much are they going to bet? So this other Italian guy was there and he walked up and says, yeah, I want to, I want to bet. So Phil, I don't know who it was anyway, at the end, what, whoever it was, Phil lost the bet, but Phil demanded that I hold the money, Phil's 10,000, which I had, and the guy give me his 10,000, which I will hold until after Phil said he didn't trust the guy. So the guy said, fine. So when Phil lost, the guy came to me right away and says, do you have my money? And I said, yeah. So I reached in my inside coat pocket to grab it and Phil grabbed my wrist and asked me not to pay the son of a bitch. (laughs) I was like, what? I said, but Phil, you lost the bet. 
He said, it doesn't matter that I lost the bet. You work for me. And I said, don't pay him. And I said, Phil, remember what I told you the first day I was hired. I said, if you're going to be like this, he said, Mike, you're out of here. You're on the next flight home. And we were staying at the Navarro Hotel on Park Avenue, which is a, a distance from uh, the hotel we were at, the Waldorf Astoria. So I said, fine. I reached in and just reached over and handed the guy the 20000 And I walked out and took a cab to go back to my hotel room. So later on at about maybe 1 o'clock or 1.30 in the morning, I get a knock at my door. And I peeked through the keyhole and there's two beautiful women knocking on my door and said, are, are you Mike Stone? I said, yeah. They said, oh, Phil Spector sent us to apologize. Can we come in? So I said, just a second. <laughs> I couldn't open the door fast enough. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Phil never apologized for it at, at breakfast the next morning. So he never said, because he said that I'm leaving, I'm going home on the next flight, which was th that morning. George Brand called me up because George uh, joined us on that trip. And I said, oh, I'm not leaving. When he called me up and says, oh, Phil is waiting downstairs. He wants to have you join us for breakfast. So I said, well, I thought I'm flying home today. He said, no, Phil said, it's okay. But Mike, he'll never apologize in person. I said, fine. So that was our first distant trip away from Los Angeles that this thing happened. And from that moment on, there's only been two other occasions that he tried to provoke a fight with two homicide detectives uh, in the court, uh, just outside the courtroom uh, in Los Angeles. But, uh, and one other time at his uh, class reunion, his 10th year class reunion, he tried to be a jerk again and um, so I just backed away. And, you know, you want to pick a fight? Have at it. Based upon this great story you just told me, I, you know, I was going to ask you if you ever had situations that he provoked uh, just to kind of see how you would react or whatever. But, uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and I was, reason why I was thinking of that is obviously what put him in prison. And, and I was just curious if his mindset most of the time kept him in trouble most of the time. And it sounds well, to me like he was a loose cannon a lot. Yeah, I mean, there are, now when I say countless, that's a, that's a very big exaggeration. But there were many times throughout those nine years I worked with him off and on that a similar event happened with a girl and a gun. Mm -hmm. A couple of times at his place, uh, where the same thing happened. I was here in the Philippines when I heard it on the news that Phil Spector was charged with murder and what the situation was. And when I was here, I said out loud, I went into the yard and said as loud as I could to myself, guilty as charged. Exactly. I got to tell everybody real quick, because if I if I don't do this, I'd, I'd feel really bad about it. But I, I want the people that are listening to this episode of, of Talk and Rock Radio about how I initially met you. And it was in 1977 when my band was just coming out of a three and a half year tour of the U.S. and Canada. We were coming back to L.A. to add a couple more players to, uh, to our group. And while we were there, we, we get this uh, phone call from a, a young lady who we got very close to. Uh, she was the drummer for a group called the Dehan Sisters. And we had performed with that band in Winnipeg, in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And my wife and I really just fell in love with these girls. They were so nice and so nice to our group, and we got to be very close with them. So anyway, while we were there in L.A. regrouping, and we were performing while we were there in Orange County and, and, and north of there, but we got this uh, phone call one day from, from Wani, from the Day Han sisters, uh, calling my wife to see if, uh, if she could bring her boyfriend to see our band play. And, uh, and Sharon said, well, sure, uh, we can go tonight if you'd like, you know. And, and she said, well, no. Uh, she said, we're having dinner with Engelbert tonight. And so uh, 
She said, well, tomorrow night will be fine. So anyway, they came and uh, they're sitting there in front of the stage and, and my wife is on one side and, and Wani's sitting in the middle and then um, her, her boyfriend sitting on the other side. And my wife said, you know, your, your boyfriend acts very martial arts like, you know, the way he's moving and all that. He just looks like he might be in martial arts. And she said, I had just finished reading this book called Elvis, what happened? And uh, and they're talking about Mike Stone in there and everything. And and so my wife said, "Well, do you think your your boyfriend, because he's living here in L.A., he might know Mike Stone?" And Wani says, "That is Mike Stone." So anyway, that was our uh, that was our introduction to you, Mike. She had not heard your name yet <laughs> until that moment, but. Uh, yeah. I think on the on the break that night after we got through playing our first show uh, is when I met you and and uh, it was uh, quite a quite a very big moment for me just meeting this iconic individual that I always had so much respect for. You don't know my background. I do have a little bit of martial arts. I never got proficient at it. I was a freshman in college. In fact, the guy that taught me. His name is Greg Allen. He is our current police chief here in El Paso, Texas. But he was a tough karate teacher. And uh, he I, I remember one thing. He said, when you're working with me in my class, if you're not bleeding when you leave, then you're not doing it right. And I remember one particular thing that he was doing. He had a bucket, uh, a, a, a pail with rice in it and we would you know punch into that you know and i mean and if you do if you did it right you're probably going to be okay but if you did it wrong you're going to be bleeding by the end of of that particular session so i always remembered that but he did like he did like my uh my work on the bag he said you've got good form and all that so <laughs> that was my big claim to fame but anyway, that was uh, that was an exciting night meeting you that night, and uh, it was incredible. We still uh, stay in touch with the girls. In fact, the other night when I talked to you, Mike, Tarina had called me right before we were trying to hook up on on our call. I forgot to tell you that. So she said, wow. "Tell Mike I said hello." For sure, please. They yeah. are so incredible. They are. What that the group? They're a, an incredible group. Uh, I, I even Thank asked, you. I asked Tarina that night. I said, "Oh, when did you all first meet, Mike?" And and I guess she uh, she remembered that it was probably at the Aladdin Hotel. They were playing there, and I think yeah. uh, you came in that night or something and saw them. So, yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, they're an Thank awesome you. group. Nice, nice girls. We're going to do a, an episode with them eventually. But okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the ninja movies you know share with me the mindset that you of course you choreographed that big fight scene and that and, and I, I've watched it probably 25 times and what is the uh, of course your proficiency is perfection so I, I know it's kind of a dumb question but I just wonder what's going on in your mind when you're choreographing a scene where you've got 20 guys coming at you what what goes through your mind during that whole process well i don't i i don't know that i can recall specific things what happens is uh uh you understand about universal energy okay i so, do yeah so a, a lot of people don't so um, th there's a state we can enter into that's not our normal state of consciousness, not this you and I. We can get into other states. Uh, you know, people say you're in the zone, you're like this. You know, when you, you do things that you're not consciously aware in the moment you're doing it, what you're doing. It's so free, it's so natural, it's so effortless that things just happen. It happens despite your conscious awareness. So when you shift energy, you actually go into a higher frequency. I call that heightened awareness. So you change your normal vibrational resonance. So in my normal state of thinking, like right now, I, I think and I can 
make decisions based on prior experience, knowledge, and things like that. You understand? I can, I can draw upon my intelligence, my awareness, my reasoning. I can think like that in this state. But when you're totally creative, like in that state, when you're when you're creating something that you've never created before, and it's it's in your mind that you create, like even creating, if you have 20 people, like you said, who's doing what? What are they moving? Why are they moving that way? What is the area we're in? Are we in a bar? Are we outside in the forest? Are we in the jungle? I mean, knowing is another level of heightened awareness that you're not aware of, but you know, you know without knowing. I know that sounds stupid, but uh, th the other thing is that we can only teach what we know. If I'm, if I'm going to teach karate and we get in a class, I am limited by what I know. So I will teach what I know. Now, it may be limited, but in a wide range of things. I may know many things. So I can teach all that I know. But all that I know is limited, so I cannot teach beyond what I know. But if I get into heightened awareness, if I put myself in another vibrational frequency that I am now not using my own personal experiences, but I can draw upon infinite knowledge and wisdom from other dimensions, from other things that I have not known or previously experienced. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay. Yeah. So, so in that state, when I'm being totally creative, because I have to draw upon experience and knowledge I did not have prior to that. So I have to shift my engine into a faster pace and now i must be open to draw from infinite wisdom and intelligence i have to draw from another medium that was not my normal awareness and state of education and process of learning so, so that's as you, what you do but, yeah so yeah. as you as you watch that again the result of what you did did you see anything that you would say to yourself right now? I wished I'd have done this instead of that. Or were you happy with what you created? No, never happy. Yeah, never happy. <laughs> now, 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 no, I have to explain why I say that uh, because I'm not, a, I'm not really a perfectionist. I'm really quite a lot less. But what I mean is that when you're making movies, you're not in control. The budget is, the director is, the producer is, the script is. All of these things supersede whatever you are willing to contribute that you think might make the movie better. There's time constraints. There's financial constraints. There's sure. physical limitations. But the people that you're asking them to do things they've never done, they don't know how to do that. They right. don't have experience. So how could I possibly in all honesty, say to you that I'm satisfied. Of course not. If I, if I had the time, the equipment, the finances, if I could create it myself, I would produce something very different, very different. But I was limited in my availability to what I can do, the talent I have to work with, the experience they have, their physical ability, the budget, the script. You know, no, no, I was not happy. I'd like to talk a little bit, Mike, about your your lifestyle teachings. Um, I would just say, I wished I was 20 years, 25 years younger than I am now, because I would have loved to come to the Philippines and be with you for about three or four weeks, because I recently watched the documentary of you with Julian, and I, abs I absolutely love that. After I watched that, I was so energized by watching you guys work together. He was really a good student, and he had really good form. I don't know what his uh, karate he never background. Trained before. Pardon me. He never trained before. He had never trained. Oh my no. goodness! I was blown away with what he was doing. I mean, he was so good. I think you were impressed too. Yes, of course. 
because it's rare that somebody can, uh, you know, I, I met him at a resort. He oh, owns really? another resort next to a friend of mine that owns another resort on the same island. So when my, the guy that owns the resort that I go to all the time, he's also a student of mine, his whole family, his, his daughters, his son and his wife are all students, including him. So I used to go there and have my warrior weekends. I would have fun just for the weekend. And then I would teach for free. We would have people come there. And so when this other guy, when Julian somehow opened up his restaurant, he would go over to see this other guy that had a restaurant. In fact, uh, Franz Bauman, the guy that owns the resort that I'm talking about, he helped Julian open up his restaurant and resort. So when he came over and uh, Franz talked to him about me and he said, really? I mean, you, you think, you think I could learn? He said, oh yeah. So when I went there, he says, next time Mike comes by, come, come and get me at my resort. Tell me he's there. I'd like to come over and talk to him. So when Franz knew I was coming because he lives on a small island that he comes to get me in one of these fast little jet boats because I have to come from the main island to the island that they have the resort on. So he knew in advance I was coming. So he already told Julian that I was coming that weekend. So as soon as I arrived, within 30 minutes after me actually arriving at the resort, Julian already was over there, started to talk. And I think within 15 minutes, he was sold. He says, I will come there for, I think, 21 days or and, and take a program with you. I said, but what are, you just opened up the resort. He said, no, it can wait. I need this now. But Julian did very well. Would you share with everybody, Mike, about your, your lifestyle teachings and what it encompasses and, you know, the options that you have and how it works? And, and you know, you don't have to go into great detail, but just share a little bit about how, uh, what, what's expected of the students when they come there and what the outcome will be. Well, now when you talk about expectations, that's one of the things we don't do. Well, okay, so, I don't mean, I, I meant from a standpoint, obviously somebody wants to come there to study with yeah. you. So they have yeah. expectations that they're going to come back a, a, a different person. That's what I meant by that. Yeah. And, and that's what, yeah. that's what. I mean both ways. Yeah, it's, excuse me. I mean uh, both ways, Rick. I do not have expectations for them. They shouldn't have any for themselves or from me. Expectations only produce two things, disappointment and unhappiness. For the most part, that's what happens. So expectations to me, and I know people have them, but when we come, that's one of the first things we talk about. If you have expectations, Forget it. Expect nothing. Thank so, you for clearing that up because program, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the program started, again, the inception of this started the day my mother died when I was 11 years old. So the morning that she died, uh, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's important to understand, again, how I created a mindset and a belief system that allows me to short circuit humanity system. Many things that I do completely destroys what we have perceived life is on earth. Now I can understand a lot of our beliefs because earth, our earthly experience that we chose to be here is relativity. The nature, the natural rules and laws of the physical world already make it that you, everybody is a hypocrite. Everybody's a hypocrite. You cannot be a hypocrite and live in the physical world of relativity. Relativity by definition means dichotomies, contradictions, polarities, opposites. In our world, it's hot, cold, black, white, up, down, in, out. That's the physical world of relativity. And between the extremes are all the shades of grays that we want to color it. And those shades of grays are called perception. 
our perception can change from the wide range of this or that, hot or cold, black or white. This, this is the physical world. We chose to live here. So we have to abide by thy laws. Yet, having said that, there is there are laws that supersede the physical world, and that's universal laws. These, these laws of the universe are very different. And this is what our earthly scientists, physicists primarily, are trying to figure out. We're, we've pretty much done the best we could. We have a lot to go with the human brain, but with understanding physicality. Now we're interested in the cosmos. We're interested in the universe. We're interested in universal intelligence. We're interested in what is consciousness. So a lot of these things are, are energies that are non-physical. That means they operate in the world of the absolute. They have nothing to do with the physical world in which we live. And yet, since we've chosen to live here, we are com confined and restricted pretty much in our own mind to the limitations of physicality. We also live in the universe. The earth is simply the place we're on, but the energies of the universe is also the energies that surround the earth. So I would rather spend my time learning about the universe than about planet earth. So our perceptions while we live here become as limited as it is living on earth because we are bound primarily by the physical laws that means energy that vibrate if you look like if if you're in my room or look at your room if you look in your room you look around at every single thing in your room everything the drapes the floor the curtain the chair the microphone your sunglasses the shirt you're wearing everything 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 in the physical world vibrates at a particular frequency of energy, everything. Now there are energies that vibrate that are non-physical, that we don't see them, sound waves, picture waves. There's a lot of energy, much more powerful than physical vibration, that actually is the power of the universe, but we don't understand it. Why? Because we have come to believe in the physical world that only the things we can hear, see, smell, taste, and touch affect my personal life. And it does. But there is so much more to your personal life than your five senses. So when my mother died, it was such an abrupt change. It was like I woke up at 5.30, my sisters were crying, my brother was crying, my father was crying. And I woke up from a sleep and wonder what the hell is going on here? Why is everybody crying? And they said, oh, mom died. And I, I was trying to think, I was still very foggy. And I said, well, who's going to make breakfast? <laughs> I mean, you know, what? <laughs> no, no, she's dead, she's gone, no breakfast. And I was thinking, but wait a minute. She was just alive a minute ago. In fact, a second ago, she was alive. And in the very next second, she doesn't exist? No. Wow. How fast is that? Now, it took me years to totally understand what my mind, my brain actually had already had a revelation about and was, was slowly making new pathways into my brain to make a new belief system about this instantaneousness of life. That one second you're alive, next second you're dead. That is the truth of our existence. So I'm wondering, why is everybody always so surprised when they hear of somebody's death? Hey, did you hear this guy just died? I was talking to him yesterday. No, but he's not here now. And we are, like, it's incredulous. How can it be? He was young, healthy. My goodness, what is the surprise? What is the surprise? It's this denial of our personal mortality that makes us totally detached from the reality of life. And when we are, we are detached from the power 
of the universe. Why? The universe doesn't know time. Time is a man-created illusion. Time is our perception. We created time before it was just sun up and sunrise. It was the moon. It was the star. All of a sudden, man says, now I can measure it to hundreds, one thousandth of a second. <laughs> Why? Why? What? For what reason? Oh, because we can keep better time. That whole idea was that once I perceived that my life was simply the moment I was living and that in that moment of life is my moment of death. So if I can die in the moment, then I should be able to live in that moment. Live meaning live to the best of my ability. Be, be present, be alive, be aware, be conscious. When? In the moment I am in, now. Be here, now. So when I talked about your physicality, I said, if you look around, everything in your room is vibrating. I failed to tell you the power. And that of all the things in your room vibrating that are physical, your brain vibrates at the highest frequency of anything. It is the most powerful creative force on earth. You don't believe me? Look around. Look at all of our technology. Look at everything. A human mind, several maybe, brains, came up with this idea. So we have so much power individually. We have the ability, the potential. That's another word I dislike. Overly used, potential. Everybody has potential. For sure, everybody does. But to me, potential is like I'm, on, like I'm out in the South China Sea on a little canoe and look at the horizon and it's endless water and I keep paddling. And the more I go toward the horizon, it keeps moving back. Potential, that's what it is. Unlimited. But who gets to even scratch the surface of their potential, of what they're capable? I'm not talking about in the future. I'm talking about in the present moment you are living. Your potential is now where you are. Even the idea about goals, for example. People set goals, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Well, people are setting goals for the future, right? Mm -hmm. What future? Well, if you ask them, they say, well, you know, maybe a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, I want to become this. I want to do that. I want to have this. So it's going to take me time to get these things, to study, to learn, to become these ideas. It's a very foolish way of looking at life to me. If you already tell me that you're going to project yourself a year from now, that you won't, you'll deny yourself the opportunity to achieve that now. So you're going to put it off for a year. But after a year of not doing anything about it, as you come close to the goal, you say, oops, it's next month. I didn't do anything for 11 months. Let me simply move it back another year. So you scratch out like 2021 and you put 2022. So now you extend yourself another year simply by erasing the last digit on the number of the year. And you now feel, oh, my God, <sighs> what a weight lifted off my shoulder. I have another 13 months to attain my goal. I mean, how stupid is this? And I say stupid, not meaning to be condescending. But if you have a half a brain, no, that's too much. If you had a fourth of a brain, you must understand this already. Not from what I'm telling you, from your own life's experience that you keep putting things off. You keep separating and extending yourself from yourself. That means from where you are now. So why not create the idea, since I have the power to do that, why not create the belief system within myself that if it's anything that I want, now I may not get it as fast, but I can produce it because the universe will help me. So. I can now, the law of attraction, for example, that's a law, not a man-made law. It's a natural law. It has to do with energy, both the ability to send it or transmit the energy or vibrational impressions and to receive it. So you have a brain that is both a transmitter and receiver of vibrational images and impressions. So if you have this much power to not only send, but to receive, Wow, you have a two-way radio. 
So we have this ability. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say you just said the magic word because I've I've been in the two way radio business for the last thirty five years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But actually, you've been in it all your life. Pretty much, a, a half a lifetime, you know, pretty much, for about forty years. But anyway, yeah, it it all makes sense, Mike. It's really, really good stuff. It really is. I wished, I wished I could come over there and just live with you for a month and and learn you know because you were you are the epitome of the guy that is physically mentally um it's got to be fulfilling for you to be transforming people and helping them gain what you have oh i mean it's there's nothing like it i mean there's there's nothing like being with somebody confined for eight, 10 hours a day, for a week, two weeks, 21 days, 30 days, and see the transformation they go through. It's so powerful that, listen, even their, even their wives, their children cannot recognize them. Wow. There is something about them that change. And some of these people come at 60 years old, and when they change, they change forever. And they started at 60. So if they can change that fast, and why not? Why not change that fast? Because when you're here, we are living these moments. We're living the philosophy. We're not telling you some, some story that is not attainable. No, you will see through your own personal experience. You may not even sense it because the transformation is moment by moment. It's not like you can look back after a month and say, oh, look what I did. No. You don't know you're changing because you're living the changes moment by moment. So many times when, when even the, the, the wives, the husbands, the children, the friends, the business partners, the employees say, wow, you, where do you, you change so much. What happened? Nothing. I, what do you mean I changed? I, I'm the same person. No, you're not. One wife says to me, you know, that's not the man I married 17 years ago. I said, what do you mean? He's not the same guy. And he's been with you for only seven days. What did you do to him? I said, I did nothing. No, come on, Mike. What? I mean, now the, his children came also with the wife to say that they wanted to talk to me. They said, well, you know, before my father was only interested in drinking with his friends, you know, going here, doing this, all of these things. But within seven days, he actually asked us. The kids were so shocked. They said, you know what my dad actually asked us? He actually said to us one weekend, so listen, kids, what do you guys want to do this weekend? And everybody stopped and looked around and said, us, we as a family, we're going to do something? They said he's never, never thought about us. Sometimes he come drunk at, come home drunk at 2 o'clock in the morning riding a motorcycle, drinking with his, with his friends. And doesn't know that we're worried sick. But he said, what? I said, I do nothing. And I don't. I really don't do anything. I cannot change you. That's not my job. My job is to make you aware of you. That's my job. The sooner, the faster. No, I'm serious. You've got a book coming out. And yeah. uh, I know you're you're still working on getting the publisher and everything. You're getting ready to go meet with Engelbert pretty soon and all that. So uh, my wife wanted me to let you know uh, that I'm going to send you some stuff. She's been, you know, doing some reading and research and things, and you may already know some of this stuff, but I'm going to, I'll I'll send it to you by email, some of the stuff that she's researched. That. Yeah. That's, I appreciate that. And I, and I, uh, I look so much forward to, reading the book uh when when it does come out mike this has been yeah. a valuable experience talking with you tonight um uh, thank you for taking your your busy time to uh to share with us uh i very much appreciate it uh, you're really a neat guy and i really want you to know that thank from you. the bottom of my heart i really uh appreciate you i appreciate our friendship and uh let's uh Let's try to stay in touch more often, okay? We will stay in touch, and that's right. All right. I like that. 
Okay, my buddy. We'll talk to All you right. real. We'll talk to you real soon. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk to you yeah. soon. Bye bye. Bye bye now. I'd like to thank El Paso History Radio Show. Barbara Given Bainey, remember an El Paso win. The El Paso History Alliance and KINT 98 Radio. Tell all your friends about the show because without you, our mission is only half done. This is Rick Kern saying be kind to one another and we'll see you next time.